Greetings. Are you a municipality or a county or a state that is considering food waste regulations and are wondering which model to follow, whether that's California or Boulder, Colorado, or Hennepin County, Minnesota, or the state of Vermont? Are you a business that's wondering how to navigate the patchwork of food waste regulations uh, throughout the U.S. and Canada? Or are you an organics hauler or processor that wants to meet the demand created by these mandates or expand organics recycling infrastructure outside of mandated areas? No matter what, welcome to Understanding Food Waste Regulations and Compliance. I am your host. My name is Ryan Cooper, and I am a waste diversion manager and the organics recycling lead at Rubicon. Um, so uh, every day I am designing internal food waste collection um, programs and uh, connecting our clients with uh, service providers and, and processors, um, as well as uh, helping to manage those programs uh, once they're underway. So. I am joined today by three amazing speakers, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves here in a minute. Uh, but first, I want to make sure that everyone knows about Rubicon uh, that doesn't already. So uh, very quickly, we are a software company uh, that currently helps more than 50 cities around the world uh, implement technology that um, makes their municipal fleets more efficient and gather data and help save taxpayer dollars. Um, and we also help companies of all sizes uh, manage their waste and recycling contracts and importantly to compile the data um, around all their different waste streams. So organics recycling is a very, very tiny part of what we do. Uh, but the value that we bring is that we compile all the data across all the locations and all the waste streams and uh, boil that down to um, you know data that is actionable so that folks know their diversion rates and uh, those environmental metrics that allow them to mark uh, their progress towards uh, sustainable materials management goals, uh, whatever they may be. And um, we are a certified B Corporation, um, which means that um, we have a responsibility uh, not just to um, make a profit and stay in business, but also uh, to benefit people and the planet that we all share. Um, we've been a B Corp since 2012, uh, and it's a, a huge part of, of who we are. I wanted to tell everybody about a tool that we offer our clients called uh, RegWatch. And it's a way for organizations that want to keep abreast of various regulations um, that might affect them, as well as compliance down to the site level. Um, so uh, really encourage you to, to check out this platform at rubicon.com uh, forward slash regwatch. And of course, feel free to reach out if you would like some more information. So first up is Nora Goldstein with BioCycle, uh, who needs almost no introduction. Uh, she's an absolute authority on all things organics recycling. Uh, so Nora, please uh, take a few moments to introduce yourself and your work. Thank you, uh, Ryan, and thank you to Rubicon for the invitation to participate today and welcome everybody. Uh, I've been an editor at some level with uh, BioCycle since the late 70s. Our company is based uh, in Eastern Pennsylvania in Emmaus, for those of you who always wondered how to pronounce that. Uh, I'm on the boards of several organizations and really I think the, the two up there on the slide reflect the range from really small scale diversified um, activities in organics recycling up to corporate and utility level uh, activities. BioCycle has a long history of organizing conferences. We conduct national surveys 
both on food waste and the overall state of organics recycling. And we really are all about connecting and collaborating uh, with everybody, stakeholders across the board and across the supply chain. Um, BioCycle was actually founded in 1960 by my father uh, as the journal Compost Science. And we've always reported on all facets of organics recycling uh, in terms of, you know, from a point of generation to collection to processing to end use and markets, regulations, you, you name it, industry trends. And for many, many years, we've also been covering and involved with, uh, you know, food waste prevention, recovery, donation, um, and then the recycling. We uh, ended 60 years of print publication in, in the end of 2019 and launched a digital uh, e-newsletter, which comes out weekly called BioCycle Connect, and then uh, launched our new BioCycle.net site. And uh, the archives are available and, and free, and the newsletter is free. We welcome you all to sign up. Just, just go to BioCycle.net. Thank you, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Nora. Um, really appreciate you being here today. Um, so next up is uh, Chris Foot with Wegmans Food Markets, and uh, you know, Chris, you and I have rolled out several different types of, of organics recycling uh, programs, and uh, it's really uh, exciting that that you were able to join the discussion today. So uh, please uh, introduce yourself and, and your work. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be on the call with everyone today. Uh, as Ryan has said, my name is Chris Foote. I'm the Sustainability Coordinator for Wegmans Food Markets. Uh, I've been with the company for 31 years and is in this role as Sustainability Coordinator for a little over four. Um, my primary role with the company is to oversee all of our efforts uh, to reduce waste or waste reduction uh, and recycling efforts in all facets of what we do. Um, So for, those, <laughs> so for those of you that uh, are not completely familiar with Wegmans, we are a 105-year-old uh, family-owned company. Uh, Danny Wegman is the chairman of the board. Nicole Wegman, his daughter, is our CEO. And uh, I'm sorry, Colleen Wegman is the CEO. Nicole Wegman is the executive vice president of Wegmans brand. Uh, and our corporate headquarters is, is in upstate New York in Rochester. We currently have 104 uh, locations, store locations in seven, seven states, and we open about uh, three new locations, new stores per year. Uh, we, we've got a fairly decent reputation amongst uh, food retail. Uh, we've been on the Fortune uh, list of best companies to work for since, since that started. And uh, we have uh, we dipped our toe into the food waste diversion uh, uh, efforts back in 2011. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. And again, really appreciate you being here today. Um, so next up is Hadley Laughlin. Um, we've known each other for, for years now and uh, super honored that you were able to, to join us for the discussion today. Um, so please uh, take a moment to introduce yourself as well. Well, thank you, Ryan, and thanks, Rubicon, for organizing this. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and have this conversation. Uh, a little bit about me. I joined Chick-fil-A in March of 2017 as a contractor in supply chain, working on waste reduction initiatives. Uh, then in January 2018, I was converted to staff within the sustainability department, which is my current role now, which I focus on uh, sustainable packaging, compliance, and waste and recycling services. Uh, I currently sit on the board for a for Live Thrive, which runs Charm, the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials here in Atlanta. Uh, and I've got to give a shout out to my four amazing children. And the Chick Fil A, uh, our corporate social responsibility department, uh, focuses on nourishing the communities for a better world. And our CSR framework, we have four pillars. The first pillar is caring for people then caring for communities, caring for others through our food, and caring for our planet, which is what sustainability focuses on. And as you can see, our focus areas are food waste, which we're gonna to discuss today, as well as sustainable packaging, um, energy and water, and our campus, our support center campus. And just wanted to provide some 
uh, figures, facts and figures for you all from 2019 uh, with our impact from our sustainability team. Um, and we, so we've reduced our plastic use by eight and a half million pounds through the introduction of our new bowl system in our restaurants, as well as downgaging our cutlery. Uh, we've diverted 100% of edible food waste from our support center campus. And we've achieved zero antibiotics in the chicken we serve to our guests. And through our shared table food donation program, we donated 4.1 million meals. So very excited about that. Thank you, Ryan. All right, thank you, Hadley. Um, this is great. Uh, thank you guys all so much for uh, joining today. Um, and thanks for all of our attendees. Um, you know, really appreciate you taking an hour to delve into this topic. Um, I will say that we are going to have um, about, uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes of discussion, and then we're going to take questions at the end. So feel free to add your questions into the, the Q&A module. Um, so I don't want to go too far into the facts and figures around food waste. Um, and, um, you know, that many of us have heard uh, many, many times, um, but, you know, for Folks that aren't aware, you know, why are we talking about food waste? Why are governments making uh, goals and, and uh, passing legislation around food waste? Um, you know, the some of the statistics are that, you know, in 2018, the, the latest figures that we have from the EPA, um, you know, including the industrial sector, uh, there were more than 103 million tons of food waste in the United States in 2018. Um, so, you know, about 30 to 40 percent of the food that we produce in the United States uh, never makes it to, to someone's plate. So um, it's the number one material by weight going going into both landfills and um, combustion uh, with energy recovery. Um, and so when food waste goes into landfills, it creates methane, uh, which is both a, a harmful greenhouse gas and also a, a source of renewable um, natural gas. So, um, you know, instead of landfilling or, or burning uh, food waste, uh, it really can be seen as a resource. So throughout, you know, most of the rest of nature and the rest of human history, um, you know, the waste for one organism is, is very often food for another. And so, um, as you can see from uh, the Ellen MacArthur uh, Foundation image here on the slide that we're gonna have up um, for the presentation, um, um, you know, these these uh, this food waste can be used for many, many products. So, of course, we follow the EPA food recovery hierarchy uh, where, you know, the number one mission is to reduce food waste in the first place. Can it be used as a product um, and, and never actually considered a waste? Um, can it be donated if it's, you know, edible um, and, and nutritious food uh, for folks that are in need, uh, especially with the economic conditions um, brought on by the pandemic, it's, it's more urgent than ever. Um, and aside from that, you know, there's animal feed. Um, in permaculture, we call it stacking functions. So can food waste be used to, um, you know, create vermicompost and black soldier fly larva and biofuels and other bio-based um, products uh, through rendering or uh, renewable natural gas or anaerobic digestion. And finally, you know, compost and, and fertilizers that can help um, improve soil health, which improves uh, water quality, it improves plant health and animal health, which in turn affect, affects human health. Um, you know, can food waste be used to grow more food uh, that's brought back into our kitchens um, in, in this virtual cycle and, and circular economy that um, we see here in this image? So uh, can that help create more uh, resilient and sustainable uh, communities that can um, help us, you know, adapt and, and overcome challenges like uh, pandemics and uh, cyber attacks or, or natural disasters. Um, can can food waste be seen as a resource? And um, you know, one. Uh, 
note on the term food waste in and of itself is somewhat contentious. Uh, EPA uses wasted food to uh, incorporate both excess food, which is, um, you know, food that can still be uh, eaten by, by people, um, and also food waste. So um, just know that we will be touching on, on donation here, um, but that, you know, some products, um, you know, whether they're packaged products that, um, you know, are uh, subject to a recall or they're out of spec or they're expired and, and can't be donated or uh, carrot tops or onion skins that, that folks, you know, might not find as, as palatable or, or attractive. So, um, you know, there there is um, a lot within just the, the term food waste. So um, without further ado, uh, let's jump right into this and, and start with you, Chris. So um, can you paint us a picture of how um, food waste intersects with, with your company and, and give us a little bit of history there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wanna start with a little background, a little history of, of how we started on this journey with food waste. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, we started our, our efforts beyond donations and beyond, uh, in some store locations, animal feed. Uh, we are partnered with uh, a number of farmers um, where we do business in, in certain store locations. So beyond that, we started food waste diversion uh, via composting in 2011. And, you know, as as, as a company, we have some, some core values. One of those, which is really key and, and I think uh, aligns with what we're doing with food waste is making a difference in the communities we serve. So I know you're gonna talk a little bit about regulations um, and how that plays into all of this, but uh, to our knowledge, in 2011, we, were, we started diverting food waste prior to any state passing legislation or at least any state that we were doing business in. I think the first one was Massachusetts, which passed legislation that went into effect in 2014. So we got out ahead of it. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we're always trying to do is, uh, you know, we, we operate and we live by high standards and we're always pushing ourselves to be a little bit better, continuous improvement. So, you know, as a food company, uh, we saw food waste uh, as an issue maybe before it really came to, to public light. Um, and, and as part of high standards and continuous improvement, we saw an opportunity to at least try to do something with it. Uh, we were fortunate um, back in 2011 to find, and this was the challenge, right, when, when everybody was trying to start out at least 10 or 15 years ago, to find a partner. So yeah, we can, we can divert, we can separate the food waste from the other waste, then who takes it? Where does it go? And that was certainly a an early challenge. Uh, we were for, fortunate when we first started to, to partner with a company here in Rochester um, to really uh, help us uh, do proof of concept. We proved that we could do this at the store level at one of our high volume stores here in Rochester. Uh, the pilot program was very successful. Um, you know, we had some some conversations with higher up within our within our corporate structure. Um, showed the data, showed that we could do this successfully, showed that our people, uh, both our customers and our, our employees, uh, were, were all on board for this. Um, again, making a difference. Our folks at the store level felt very good about this. And then uh, we went from there. And so I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, as I mentioned, 104 store locations, we have all these uh, store locations diverting food waste now beyond uh, beyond donations and beyond, uh, in some cases, animal feed. Got it. Got it. Thank you so much, Chris. And, um, you know, Hadley, same question to you. Um, you know, how does, how does food waste intersect with, with your company's mission? Sure. Um, so our company, um, we began our food donation program. We first, we focus on food waste in sort of two categories, edible food waste and inedible. Uh, we first tackled uh, the edible food waste and started our shared table food donation program back in 2012. Um, we partner with Food Donation Connection out of Knoxville, Tennessee, been a great partner of ours. Uh, they help our restaurants. We've got over 2,600 locations across the U.S. and in Canada, so they help us, you know, align agencies, local agencies with our restaurants. Um, and so currently we have over 60% of our restaurants participating in the program. It is an optional program for our restaurants, 
But our goal is to have 100% of our restaurants participating in it. It's, it's a win-win for everyone we see. Uh, and just wanted to point out that in 2020, um, the program uh, through Shared Table, we uh, donated eight, over eight and a half million meals to um, you know folks who uh, hungry, uh, the hungry in our communities, uh, which equates to over nine million pounds of food waste diverted from landfill. Um, as far as our mission goes, our mission at Chick-fil-A focuses on being a good steward of our resources that are entrusted to us and having a positive impact with all those who come into contact with Chick-fil-A. So our food waste um, diversion strategies definitely fit within that. Uh, we first focus on reducing our waste through our lean procedures, so source reduction, um, and then helping those in need in our communities with the shared table food donation program. Awesome. Awesome. That's incredible. So thank you guys both so much for um, that overview. And then, Nora, why don't you hop in here and tell us, you know, why are we talking about food waste um, and, and specifically food waste regulations? Sure. Uh, you know, it's interesting when I think back to the history of BioCycle's coverage of uh, food waste diversion, it, it was grocery stores really. And, and um, in 1991, I think it was at a food marketing institute conference in Washington, D.C., and they had come out with a white paper on why composting was a very good tool for uh, supermarkets in terms of reaching, you know, at the time, I'm not even sure they used the word zero waste, but by the time you maximized recycling and you maximized your diversion of your food waste streams, your organic streams, there was very little trash left. And and so um, it's many, you know, we're a number of decades in to the uh, benefits of recycling food waste, um, probably the overlay of the hierarchy with prevention and recovery. Animal feed has been happening for years uh, in food manufacturing, for example. Um, and then linking that to uh, you know composting or anaerobic digestion to put that that diverted food waste to use. Um, and the best part of the picture is when you can completely close that circle and grow food in the diverted, you know, the compost to amend the soils, to grow the food, to go back into the food supply, um, et cetera. So um, it's it's pretty much a win as long as, you know, everything is done. Uh, science, uh, composting is an art and a science. It, it, um, it's a biological process, but it, it um, can become unforgiving if it's not done correctly. Similarly, anaerobic digestion um, and uh, regulations uh, for the processing of food waste um, have been established uh, at the state level. Uh, and what we have seen, and gosh, it was in the state of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Solid Waste Management Plan, I want to say they're 2010, maybe before, uh, to look at a disposal ban on, on commercial organics. Um, and that actually uh, was a regulation went into effect in October 2014. Uh, and that that particular ban um, does it's any generator over a ton a week of food waste with no what we call a proximity clause. Um, didn't matter if you were 20 miles, you know, you had a nearby facility that could take your food waste or not. If you were generating over that amount, you had to comply. Other states, uh, Connecticut may have preceded, uh, I always forget the order, um, but the New England states, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, all adopted some form of, of a food waste disposal ban. Uh, interestingly, Vermont's um, was a phased in and a proximity, in other words, it, it was first applied to businesses generating over a ton a week, then two tons a week each year, you know, ramping up. And then by 2020, um, no food waste at all allowed in the landfill or to be disposed. And that took effect in, effect in July. So it's an interesting case study of when you're, you know, phasing. 
Um, since those New England states, California, um, through their a couple of big legislation, uh, pieces of legislation, 1826, for example, uh, is a phase in on commercial organics generators, both yard trimmings and food waste, then their SB 1383 rule, which is all under the, the greenhouse gas mitigation um, is a mandate. It's not a disposal ban. California doesn't have disposal bans. And that is the beginnings of those regulations start to happen in the beginning of 2022. Most recently, New York and New Jersey have adopted uh, past laws, uh, which are both, in both cases, start with um, well, they both have proximity, and I'm pretty sure they both have, you know, the quantity generated. Um, and what's interesting is the California, New York, and New Jersey laws all have requirements built in for food recovery and donation. Um, we've seen that happen as a result of the bans in states like Vermont and Massachusetts, where there was an increase in donation. But their legislation, New York, New Jersey, California, it's all within the statute. I just want to quickly touch on regulation at the local level. Ryan alluded to, to that. New York City has, has a mandate or regulations for certain size generators of food waste in the commercial sector. Hennepin County adopted and expanded an ordinance. Um, Seattle and San Francisco, I think, Brian, you mentioned Austin Boulder. So we're seeing activity regulatory wise um, to divert food waste streams, oftentimes just commercial. In some, it's also commercial and residential. And so businesses uh, like the ones joining this webinar today, depending on where they're located in what state, will have to comply with these, these regulations. Thank you so much for that um, incredible overview. So, you know, at least eight municipal bans um, in the U.S. And, and two in Canada. You know, there's two different counties in, in the U.S. Uh, you know, total of seven state bans, as you mentioned, that, you know, two of which are, are yet to go into effect, but will later this year and, and early next year. So um, there's hundreds of, of local food uh, packaging regulations. So uh, really just a, a lot going on here here um, and a lot for companies to have to, to navigate there. Um, so Hadley, let's start with you. You know, your organization, you mentioned, you know, the number of, of different locations that you have and, and you're operating in these uh, areas that have rules or, or bans. How do you view the, the regulatory landscape? Well, just as, as you've said, uh, the regulatory landscape, it's very complex because of the patchwork. Um, you know, at the local level, it's just very challenging, very nuanced. Um, you know, Chick-fil-A in one town has certain bans or regulatory requirements, and then five miles down the road, they don't have any requirements. So it just, it does make it very challenging for our supply chain. Um, we obviously want to be 100% compliant wherever we operate. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very complex, but we're not the only brand out there challenged with this. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's very challenging, but we're doing we're working at it, you know, best we can. Got it, got it. Thanks. And so, Chris, you know, obviously there's a different scale between grocery store versus restaurant. There's also a lot of similarities in the programs. Um, as you mentioned uh, earlier on, you know, you guys were ahead of, of a lot of these um, regulations, but you're kind of in the heart of that northeastern. region. In, um, where a lot of these regulations are coming into effect. Um, you know, tell us how you view uh, that, that regulatory, regulatory landscape, both now and, and in the future. Yeah, I don't know how Hadley feels about it, but I think it's, it's a little more difficult probably for the, for the small or the, for the restaurant chains um, and a little bit easier for us, I think, because just, just in the amount of volume that we generate. So, you know, the food waste hauler, um, you know, when they come to the store, they want to pick up quite a bit of material and we can provide that for them, you know, per stop. Whereas, uh, you know, a, a chain restaurant or something like that is hopefully not producing as much food waste as a grocery store. So, uh, it can be a little more challenging, I think for them. Um, 
as far as regulations, uh, a few things on that. So, again, we started back in 2011. So the, by the time that the, the first state, Massachusetts, passed regulations on, on food waste ban or food waste diversion, um, we, were, we were ready for it. We were already doing everything that we needed to do to be in compliance uh, before this became law. Uh, same thing in, in New York City. I think New York City passed in, uh, legislation in, in 2017, and we opened a store in Brooklyn, um, geez, was it last year? Two years ago. So we were in compliance, you know, when we opened the opened the doors of that store. And as, as Nora mentioned, you know, um, legislation has passed in New York and New Jersey that goes into effect January 1st, 2022. Uh, and we didn't sweat that at all. So we were, uh, we actually supported uh, and advocated the, the ban uh, for New York State. Um, we were already ready for it. Uh, it was first proposed, I think, in 2018, then 2000, or 2017, 2018, and then it passed in the 2019 budget uh, for 2020 and, and becomes law in 2022. So uh, we don't see at this point legislation or regulatory um, ordinance of, around food waste bans or food waste diversions as, as an issue for us. Uh, again, as I said, we, we have programs in all stores uh, at this point um, that we feel we would be in compliance if and when uh, leg legislation is passed. And I would say that what's kind of exciting to us now, um, our next two stores that we open this year are in North Carolina. And there there is no legislation in North Carolina. Uh, we're not aware uh, or at least I'm not aware that anything is being proposed for North Carolina, but all of our stores, uh, you know, going forward as we open, have a food waste diversion uh, program in place, and our folks are excited about it. So uh, prior to grand openings, folks from those stores and those locations are reaching out to me saying, hey, when is, when's the training coming? When does the program start? When do we get the bins for collection? Um, so we've, we've almost done kind of a 180 where... Uh, you know, first we're going and explaining and, and, and doing the training and getting in front of folks and kind of selling them on it, so to speak, right? So something new where we're now we're at the point where the folks at our stores are excited about it and, and they reach out to me first before I even get the chance to start to talk to them about it. So it's, it's really kind of exciting. Awesome. Yes, it is. Um, so, uh, Nora, what, what's your reaction and, and how do you view, I guess, food waste regulations and how they relate to, to food packaging regulations? Because they're, they're definitely related because food often comes in a package. So um, how do you see that? Um, so it's interesting with the, with the packaging regulations, um, the way it intersects is, is – uh, around single use packaging and uh, trying to get away from conventional plastic and have packaging be reusable, recyclable or compostable. And, um, you know, with compostable uh, being directly associated to, in many cases by default to the, as you just mentioned, to the food waste stream, uh, the challenge is, and, and I just, uh, help facilitate a, a workshop uh, where there will be a, a report in BioCycle coming out with the Biodegradable Products Institute uh, around how we can, can facilitate the diversion of those materials together. But at this time, um, it's not a national infrastructure in place to, to manage uh, if communities or states require those three options for single-use packaging, where is it going to go? And so part of the conversation is do you start with certain types of packaging, for example, the film plastic bag or, or you know, some uh, material yeah, package that could be switched out. There's uh, acceptance in the marketplace for the compostable alternative for example. Um, the other thing where we come into, where it comes into play, and really Washington state is the only state with a, a labeling requirement. Um, and um, with, you know, specifically, I mean, it covers labeling across the board on packaging, but 
there is a section on compostable packaging because part of the challenge is there's not uh, teeth in regulations that if if you have a packaging and let's use the 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 produce bag in the supermarket you know tinted green uh, let's just say that we could reach a point where a tinted green bag in the grocery store was a compostable bag certified compostable uh, but that doesn't exist so you might have a tinted green bag that actually isn't compostable it may say biodegradable but that doesn't mean it's compostable um, so there's a lot of uh, there's a real need and this was the consensus out of this this workshop you know to really collaborate across all sectors on education and awareness and really work towards um, some consensus around how we can make these packaging regulations. And, and everything I'm saying applies to the recycling side too, because they're faced with the same set of challenges um, in terms of customer confusion or consumer confusion and whatnot. So I'll stop there, happy to take questions on, on that. Yep. Well, uh, there's a lot there. So we'll definitely get into the internal training that, that Chris touched on, the infrastructure um, and, and public education that, that you just touched on. So uh, a lot there. Um, so we'll, we'll keep trucking. Um, and, and Chris, I want to ask you, um, you know, at a, at a base level, you know, it sounds like you're totally on top of this. Like, how easy or challenging is it to comply with with food waste and, and packaging uh, regulations? Yeah, so you know, packaging is is definitely you know we talk about challenges. So, food in a package, we we sell a lot of food in packages, and that's uh, that's a challenge, right? So, uh, we've got to get that food out of the package, uh, and some way or another to either be composted or to go to uh, anaerobic digestion. And uh, what's kind of neat, and I know you're maybe jumping a little bit ahead here on, on innovation, but um, Wegmans has nine divisions that, that, that we operate, you know, in, in multiple states, and we have nine, nine business divisions. Uh, two of those divisions just fairly recently, uh, towards the tail end of last year, um, and this is you know, in partnership with the food waste haulers and end destinations, they are innovating and 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 upgrading their businesses and and, uh, and uh, opportunities that we have with them. Two of our nine divisions now are sending material to depackaging facilities for for AD for anaerobic digestion, and then, and that's exciting for us. That helps. Uh, and there's a lot of labor involved when you have to manually uh, unpackage or take take material out of out of a package um, so that saves us there and it's just uh, you know we've seen the results now that how much more uh, food waste we can divert by sending to a depackaging facility um, so yeah and we're, we're looking to expand that to to more divisions fortunately one of those divisions is, is in New York and uh, you know we're going to expand it to the other divisions in New York so but again by the time that law becomes effect in 2022 uh, we'll have all of our stores being able to divert packaged and unpackaged food waste to uh, the facilities uh, so we can be in full compliance. Got it. Got it. Thanks, Chris. Um, and, and we'll definitely, um, you know, uh, very interested to, to hear more about, about depackaging. Um, so, uh, Hadley, what kind of internal infrastructure do you have within your organization to tackle these challenges? How do you track the rules and regulations? Sure. Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, you know, we have got a lot of considerations when it comes to, like, packaging regulations, for example. I mean, we've got, obviously, food safety is a priority for us, um, as well as honoring our food, the guest experience, and, of course, being compliant. Um, so we have an internal team. It's it's uh, it's a very strong and mighty team. We I work cross-functionally with our legal team, supply chain, our menu and packaging team, as uh, you know, we get as we see regulatory requirements and such um, that does drive our strategy. But we also, as as our mission says, we want to be good stewards as well. So um, you know, we just uh, it's a lot of collaboration with 
the various departments internally. Uh, how we track it, it's, um, there's multiple inputs, um, just because, again, it's, it's very challenging at the local level as, as, and the just sort of the cadence of, of regulatory requirements coming out with over 2,600 locations. So, um, you know, like I said, we've just got multiple inputs, you know, trackers at the federal level, state level, and, and it's really the, the big challenge is at that local level. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Um, so, Nora, you, you mentioned teeth earlier. Um, you know, I think especially with, with food waste, um, you know, I think people, I, I should say governments, are really just trying to, you know, get people headed in the right direction. And um, there, you know, is kind of a mixed bag as far as enforcement goes. Uh, what kind of enforcement do you see yeah, it, it's interesting because enforcement um, is a challenge. And, and we had an article on the city of Napa, for example, in California that um, has, you know, a three, they for their residents, they have a three stream system, you know, landfill, recycling, compostables. And um, they, you know, part of it, you know, when, the as when the laws go into effect and it's you know sometimes it's voluntary and then it switches to mandatory um it's how do you really um know if households are complying and the, you know so it's it's just tricky they went through a whole bunch of outreach and education which is what this article focuses on but found ultimately that it's almost like you have to get rid of certain kinds of packaging completely like through some sort of legislation in order to not have it be a contaminant in either the recycling or the composting stream. A big looming question in California is what is, what? how hard will, uh, in, in California, the rule is, is jurisdictions have to uh, comply with these things. And the question is, well, what about enforcement? What we've really seen over the years when there's been, it's a required action that it's, it's phased in. In other words, they'll allow a couple years time before they actually really start, you know, following up and tracking, and then they'll do warnings. And at the very end, there'll be a fine, but it's, it, the fine comes much later in the process, and it's really attempting to educate. I'm being sort of obtuse because enforcement is one of those challenging things. We've seen it, you know, from the get-go, um, you know, with state yard waste bans that were adopted in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, but it's important to have an enforcement mechanism uh, that you can work towards. Yeah, that's very interesting. And part of the, you know, trouble with enforcement is that, you know, to me, uh, regulations and infrastructure are uh, sort of a chicken and an egg situation because, um, you know, just because there is a rule in place uh, doesn't necessarily mean that there's the infrastructure available to uh, manage that material. So, you know, folks are not necessarily able to to comply. Um, you know, I think we've come a long way uh, as far as infrastructure. Uh, I definitely feel, you know, a groundswell of, um, you know, infrastructure uh, expansion. Um, but, you know, I, I have a, a baseline question, which is, you know, are food waste reg regulations necessary for moving that goalpost forward and making food reduction and diversion just a part of everyday life? Or is it the early adopters that are going to, you know, bring a bring us with them, whether regardless of mandates? So, um, I mean, Hadley, do you think that the, that mandates have to come first uh, to make this kind of, you know, everyday practice? Well, first, I think the infrastructure has to be in place. You know, again, when you've got over 2,600 locations across the country and it's such a fragmented infrastructure, um, and then within that infrastructure, uh, for example, you know, the compost facilities, the commercial compost facilities, you know, you have some that will take packaging, some that just take the food scraps. So 
again, I, to me, the infrastructure, and then I think also some standards um, in you know regulatory requirements. Just because, again, they're so nuanced from city to city, it's um, it, it just makes it very challenging. Yeah, agreed. So, you know, Chris, do you think, you know, regulations help drive that development of infrastructure? And what do you think, you know, would take, uh, what would it take to, to make bit organics recycling kind of just business as usual? Yeah, I think that legislation uh, does drive, um, um, you know, it, it creates actually some business opportunities, right? So, you know, this pending legislation or the legislation for, for New York and New Jersey potentially creates a business opportunity for somebody, right? Um, they can read the writing on the wall and see that all these grocery stores and restaurants are going to have to be in compliance with this. Someone's going to have to transport the food waste to an end destination. Um, that can be a business opportunity for someone um, to come in and, and provide those services. Uh, so in, in, in that aspect, I think it does drive um, you know, I don't think that anybody, any business, you know, when if asked, would say no. We want to absolutely want to keep throwing food out, right? Uh -huh. We want to keep getting stuff in the ground, and uh, you know, this is just an, a burdensome regulation. <laughs> That's probably not an answer you're going to hear. Um, so, you know, what you might hear is like, we absolutely want to do this, but you know, cost does need to be considered, yeah. and you know, infrastructure needs to be there if it's. You know, if, if the closest composting facility is 100 miles away um, and you start to factor in trucking costs and labor, um, that can be a burden on businesses. So, you know, as long as that's taken into consideration, uh, I like and we've seen, as Nora mentioned, kind of a phased in approach to this. And, um, you know, our experience is also when the when the legislation is passed and becomes law, um, you know, the the D Department of Environmental Conservation or DEQs are, are a little, um, I wouldn't say lenient, but the, there's a, there's a, even after it's law, there's a, a period of time before financial penalties go into effect. They have kind of an educational uh, time that may be a year or so where, you know, if they find someone in violation, it's a coaching opportunity for that company. Hey, we, we saw this, you know, just, we want to help you. Um, educate your folks on this and, and get right. So not, no financial penalty now, but if it continues, <clears throat> you know, it may be coming. Um, so yeah, long story short, this this legislation regulations does drive, um, in my opinion, some, you know, positive results. Uh, and, and as long as the, the state governments are just on this and, and work with the folks that they're going to be imposing this legislation on and, and make sure that the infrastructure is in place in there uh, for them to be compliant, uh, then it's a win-win all around. Agreed. And I mean, when you look at it that way, it's kind of amazing that there is uh, food waste diversion um, activity in areas where there isn't a mandate, but, you know, even there, uh, there is a business opportunity. Um, so, you know, Nora, what do you think the biggest challenge is that um, these organizations face when they're trying to comply? Is it the lack of infrastructure? Is it the internal training um, for the organizations? Is it uh, cost or, or is it something else that, that is the biggest challenge um, for compliance? It, it's an excellent question. and. It's funny, this is the third webinar uh, or virtual event I participate in this week, and there's that slippery word that says it's, it depends. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, and, and you, it was alluded to, um, you know, as Chris was just saying that the ability to comply is, Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to parse this out into to just constructive uh, comments, but one of the things that very quickly commercial food waste generators and households realize once they start focusing on their food waste stream is how much food they're wasting, right? So there is a significant uh, drop in food, food waste generation once you recognize 
what it is, either you're ordering too much of something, you're preparing too much of something. Um, and so, so much innovation has taken place over the last 15 plus years you know, in EPA's food recovery challenge, I, there's story after story. Uh, so one of the things when this happens, and this is why I think states like New Jersey and New York and California built in the food recovery into the ban require, you know, legislation um, it is because that's that's so key. Uh, the other thing that, that um, we find is that, yes, yeah, so let's just say there isn't a composting facility today that takes compostable packaging. What you want to do is, is so you can't include that. We'll start with, it, the word I want to end up with here in this comment is consistency. Start with a program, be consistent in your training, be consistent in what uh, your facility is, a, the nearest uh, processing facility is able to handle. Um, and it, there's a cost associated with, with it, but it's really important to also recognize that there's a benefit. I mean, very early on when supermarkets were not putting food waste in their, in their compactors anymore, they had that, they, A, didn't need as big a compactor and B, they didn't have to have it pulled this frequently because, um, the wet goopy stuff was being diverted. So there's, there's compliance um, that circles around what just makes sense and then what's available to you and just being consistent. The key you want to get to is no contamination. Try to, you know, whatever materials, uh, you know, just be very vigilant to that. Um, and um, at the end of the day, we want these organics out of the landfill and processed either via, you know, you know, we like to say anaerobic digestion and composting. You know, there's an energy generation benefit and um, uh, there's a huge soil benefit. And it's very important to stay in sync with that. And it's going to become more important, um, you know, with it, it's it's the act of diverting food waste is something we can all do to benefit, you know, the impacts of climate change because food waste emits a lot of methane in the landfill landfill and there's all these practices um common sense and ones that take a little more effort and on that contamination and uh kind of setting the general you know framework what about front of house programs um you know it's one thing to get internal staff on board um Know, what role does the government or the private sector play in educating the public so that, you know, in areas that um, were front of house um, uh, programs, uh, basically a, a bin in a public area um, where you're relying on, on, your, on your customers to make the right decision, um, how, this is a question, I guess, for everybody, if somebody wants to take it, um, how, how does, um, you know, how do we make sure that you know customers understand what what goes in what bin? Yeah, Ryan, I, I I can jump in here, and that's that's one of definitely one of the challenges that we've had um, in our stores is offering a a front of the house, if you will, solution uh, or customer facing solution. We've tried a few times uh, in our cafe areas, and what we find is there's just um, too much contamination. In the bin, even when we have, uh, you know, our home folks bussing tables and, and putting it in there, you know, trash from the customer still makes its way in there. So that's been uh, that's been an area where we could definitely use some help, you know, on public education um, and getting folks to put things into the right the right bins. Uh, you know, again, we've tried and and it just hasn't been successful yet to get customers on their own uh, to get it in the right bin, but then also not throw in the the plastic utensils or, you know, the plastic container that it came in. So it's been a real challenge. Yeah, no, I, and I will say too that, yeah, the consumer confusion, uh, you can have the visuals, the signage, you know, um, for a QSR space, you know, people are in and out, uh, they're moving quickly, they've got kids with them or, you know, what have you. There's just a lot of variables at play that, um, 
just really drive those contamination rates higher. So um, this is Nora. I, the one thing that hit me is one of the, you know, again, pre-COVID, um, but there's so many K through 12 schools uh, yeah. adopting front of house separation, if you will, in their cafeterias. And um, the enthusiasm getting, you know, I think about how if we can start this behavior change, right, you know, at whatever age, and then tie it into a school garden or a community garden. I know that sounds corny, but if, you know, I'll, any company on here, if, if, you know, to get engaged with that, to volunteer, to, to uh, the other thing we're seeing is a, just a boom in the number of, of community, you know, very small scale bike food scraps collection from commercial businesses, small scale vehicles, community composting gardens. And so there's this whole ability to really impact behavior in your community. And, you know, the goal ultimately, we hope to see it, uh, is it spills over into into the the businesses and, and whatnot. But I I just encourage people, it's, it's not impossible uh, to do it. And there's various tricks of the trade uh, that we've seen some composters that also offer organics collection, you know, sourcing. If you're going to be diverting your cups, all the cups have to be compostable. You can't have a mix. So in a grocery store setting with a cafe, is that possible? Well, it may help. It, it should help. <laughs> Well, another That's layer, uh, speaking of the sort of packaging that you were just talking about, Nora, you know, like a cup system, for example, where you've got a cup, a lid, and a straw potentially, you know, you potentially have multiple materials to play. Um, so really trying to ensure that, you know, all the whole cup system is compostable, right? Um, and meets all the other attributes of food safety and performance and all that kind of stuff for the consumer mm -hmm. is key. Yeah, and it's one thing in a enclosed environment like an arena or you know a, a concert venue. Uh, it's a it's a much different thing when you know folks can bring anything they want into your space. So uh, definitely challenging uh, to make sure that um, you know all materials are, are compostable or recyclable, for instance. But um, I know we're running low on time, and uh, we are going to go a couple minutes over to try to. Um, uh, handle some of the the audience questions, but um, you know I know uh, Chris, you talked about depackaging a little bit, but um, Hadley, want to go to you um, if there's any kind of uh, newer uh, food waste diversion technologies um, that you think might might help with compliance. Sure. Yeah. So we are actually currently piloting a uh, food waste digester in back of house. It's, um, been very exciting. Our operator who's piloting it, um, his team members are really engaged with it and it can handle our volume of food waste that we generate in back of house because we do do a lot of food prep in the back of house. And, um, you know, it does require energy and some water, um, but it's very minimal. Um, so we're excited about the potential with this um, digester machine. And it's, you know, space is always an issue too, space constraints in the back of house. So it's a little bit bigger than a dishwasher. Um, so we'll see. I mean, like, like I said, we're in a pilot stage of this, um, but it's exciting technology for sure. Yeah, and we'll, you know, we're seeing more, um, you know, wastewater, or I'm sorry, water resource recovery facilities uh, incorporating food waste and, and anaerobic digestion into their um, processes. So um, everything that you just touched on, we could uh, talk for, for a long while on. Um, but before we turn to some of these audience questions, uh, kind of want to wrap it up um, with, with final thoughts before we get to, to those questions. Um, you know, uh, Hadley, if, if you had a magic wand, uh, what would you uh, change or, or keep the same as far as regulations go? I would just say I would like to see more standardization um, across the board on regulations. It would just make it easier, you know, for our chain with over 2,600 locations. 
Yep, and you know, in these uh, amazing United States uh, of America, you know, wondering if uh, you know some sort of federal guidelines um, are possible. I know that there's you know food waste reduction goals uh, on a national level with the US EPA and, and USDA. Um, <laughs> You know, but even even in Canada, there's not you know a standardization there. Uh, Chris, if if you had your magic wand, um, what would it look like? Well, I would I would just you know a word of caution to to state and federal governments, if I could, or or, or a a call for for help is to not overregulate it. <clears throat> um, you know, one of our one of our places where we are mandated. It, to me personally, I won't I won't I'm going to not speak for Wegmans for a second here. So uh, just me personally, it seems like it's a little over-regulated, the requirements around it. You know, we have to have a, a sticker up in the front of the of the store and the front window that's, you know, says who's the, who the food waste hauler is, all the bins uh, that we transport food waste inside the store. They never, never leave the store. Uh, and they're only going from our, our departments where we're producing food waste to the back of the house. Those all have to be specifically labeled. Um, and again, you know, we're doing this at 104 locations. We have one that has all these requirements or, or regulations of what I think is just over, overkill, so to speak, on it. So when the laws do finally, in their final, final iteration, come into place, you know, hopefully they're considering, you know, ease of of for us to be able to comply with it and not and not uh, you know have when they come in and we talk about compliance and enforcement oh you don't have the sticker in the front window or oh this bin wasn't labeled properly um you know things like that so just don't over regulate it thanks chris and uh nora same question to you are there uh sticks or carrots that you think are more or less effective um any kind of localized incentives you know what 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 would you wish for well, I think uh, I was thinking about this as the others were answering, and, and I would wish for some kind of, of uh, use, you know, uh, with the compost product uh, and the, the renewable natural gas or renewable electricity out of the AD, um, because ultimately, what's going to drive this. And, you know, as long as organics recycling is an, I'll quote, an alternative to disposal to landfill. So you're an organics recycler having to compete with the landfill. You're, you're very much forced into an economic scenario that is, is, doesn't necessarily favor, uh, you know, you used to have to, you have to be really, stringent in how you manage your facilities and turn through your pro your uh, your during your processing and i think if the it was flipped and the pull was coming from the markets and the markets demanded quality and the markets demanded more of these resources to come through the system that ultimately it would strengthen it so i'm sitting here is is my big magic wand of uh, you know a national soil organic matter Thing or some something that would really stimulate. And I'll just end with California's SB 1383 rule has a procurement uh, clause, a statute, is, or it's required in there that the jurisdictions have to procure, uh, you know, the recycled material, organic, whether it's in the form of a bio, you know, renewable natural gas or a compost or a mulch. And um, I think it's important to look at that because at the end of the day, at least if you're looking through the organics recycling lens, that's why we're doing it. Incredible segue um, to, uh, we've had a ton of, of great audience questions, but one that I want to address head on, um, you know, as you mentioned, the economics and, you know, we are seeing um, some of those market drivers, you know, shift ever so slightly um, to, to help with, with the market demand. Um, 
you know, for the organics. But in a lot of cases, you know, there is a, a cost that, um, you know, I think you, you've you mentioned. Um, so, so Chris and Hadley, um, what about, you know, I think, Chris, you mentioned it too, you know, what about the increased costs, um, you know, and and there's the, you know, the, the products that are generated on the back end, um, you know, what do you guys see as the, the economic picture there? Well, I think as far as cost, we take a, a long or longer term approach to this, right? So we're not, when we started out back in 2011, it was certainly a costly process. It was costing us more. And in many cases, it still is costing us more than it would to just send it to the landfill. Um, <clears throat> but again, that long term approach, we have seen in certain divisions now, it used to cost more than sending it to the landfill. Now it costs, we're cost neutral or it costs less. So we're taking a long-term vision on this. Um, I think as a family-owned company, we, it helps us give, it, give us a little bit of flexibility where we can look a little bit longer term. Uh, we don't need an immediate, you know, someone might say, what's this going to cost right out of the gate? Oh, it's going to be, you know, $20 a ton more than throwing it out. No, we, we don't want to do that. Um, whereas we can, we'll, we'll, we'll take that on and see how it goes and, and work on the cost, bringing that down as, as we, you know, evolve the program. And so all of your locations are corporately run, right, Chris? Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So our Chick-fil-A franchise model is unique in that all of our locations, our owner operators um, have typically one location um, that, you know, they're a small business owner. And so they have a lot of autonomy, autonomy to make decisions. So um, it's not like uh, Chick-fil-A corporate can mandate them to do certain, you know, um, collection methods, right? Uh, we do, if it's a regulatory requirement, of course, we want to be 100% compliant and provide our restaurants the resources and tools to be compliant. Um, we have done some compost pilots across the country where there is infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, they have been successful in that you know we've diverted and the team members have been engaged but at the end of the day it's the cost of, of why they don't continue to do it really um because again they are their own uh, they're the owner operator and it's their business their small business that they're running um so the economics have to make sense and there are many, many businesses that are not in the business of diverting their food scraps. And so, you know, folks are focused on, um, you know, their their main uh, value proposition um, and, and waste and recycling can can come last in, in many instances. So um, another question uh, that I found really interesting was, you know, carbon sequestration. Um, you know, one of the added values aside from keeping food waste out of the landfill is that if you put it in soil, um, boom, you have healthier soil that can sequester more carbon. So a lot of times we talk about food waste diversion in terms of percent of tonnage uh, that doesn't go to landfill versus the, the, the tons that do. Um, do. Do you guys have, um, you know, carbon goals that, um, that uh, relate to, to food waste? We do not have any carbon goals at this point. That's not to say we won't in the future. We have, we have, um, you know, carbon footprint reduction goals all encompassing. It's not just um, related to food waste. You know, it's like we look at transportation, uh, refrigeration uses, electric, <clears throat> electric utilities. You know, trying to bring down our overall carbon footprint. So it's not just married just to food waste reduction. Got it. Got it. Um, and then uh, the, the last question, and then I'll let you guys uh, get back um, again. Can't, can't thank you enough for, for your time today, but um, is there a, a value uh, to your brand um, to, um, you know, manage your organics in, in a different way? Um, if so, how do you measure it? And um, I think this is a great question because so much of uh, folks' efforts are um, in Visible, um, you know, it's it's hard for um, companies to to share their success publicly on um, you know the the great work that they are doing in the in the back of the house that folks might not see. 
Well, I'll, I'll chime in here. You know, I think it, the our food waste initiatives at Chick Fil A really help with our team members in our restaurants because uh, you know our team members are often you know younger folks in, in high school and college uh, who are very passionate about these types of issues. And so you know our shared table food donation program, they really rally around um, the, the composting if they are doing it in the restaurants. They rally around it. So. I would say team member retention is a, a real great added value for us. So Ryan, I, I would say kind of as a closing thought for, for Wegmans and for myself here, <clears throat> you know, we've used the term food waste a lot on this call. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think we just need to change the, the verbiage on it. It's not really a waste product. It is a resource, right? There is a second use to this. Um, you know, first and foremost, if it's still safe and edible, let's get it into the hands that, of people that need it. And, and, you know, we know through the coronavirus, uh, even before that, there was tremendous need. The, the coronavirus pandemic has only compounded that need in our community. So let's get them um, that surplus food, right, that we're, that we're going to, um, you know, it's reached its best by, <clears throat> use by, sell by date, but it's still perfectly fine. Let's get it into the hands of the people who need it. Secondly, you know, for those things that, you know, the trimmings, uh, you know, rinds, whatever you want to, whatever you have, that is still a resource. We should not bury it in the ground. We should not incinerate it. Um, we should do something else with it. It still has value. Uh, we should turn the compost. We should, should put it in uh, AD process uh, and produce uh, electricity and energy from it. Um, and I think in some cases where we need, you know, we want to do it. I think we all want to do that. Um, um, but again, the cost piece comes into, into place and that's where not Wegmans so much, but I think other businesses could use help, um, in making it, you know, that solution financially viable for them. So it's not a cost burden as, as, uh, Headley had mentioned, right? I think if, uh, the, the free franchisees of, of Chick-fil-A, if it wasn't costing them money or if it wasn't, you know, if it was at least cost neutral, they, they'd be happy to do it. Because, you know, we, what we've experienced at Wegmans is our people are 110% on board. You know, all our folks working in the stores, um, this is something they want to do. I, I always say it's an easy sell. I have a little bit of an easy job when I go on to roll out this program at a store. Um, they're excited about it. They're excited about doing it. And... Um, you know, but that cost piece is maybe where, where um, some businesses need, need some help. You know, they're not willing to take on that burden of an increased cost, you know, because it's not the only thing they're looking at. You know, we see expenses going up across the board in all different um, facets and areas of our company. And, uh, you know, we've got to manage that cost, right? We've got to stay competitive. We've got to stay profitable um, to, stay, to stay in business. So uh, I think in terms of food waste diversion, that's where some businesses could use some help. And that's where I think we have to be cautious with the regulatory stuff, right? We don't want, you don't want to put a financial burden or an increased financial burden on companies where this can be costly and impact, uh, you know, their ability to do business. Yeah, great point. So um, Hadley, Nora, um, any any additional thoughts that you want to share before uh, we, we close it out here? Uh, this is Nora. I'd just say there are a lot of great questions in in the um, in the Q and A, and and I know I was listening to the conversation, so it was limited in my ability to respond. So I did put my uh, happy to share my contact information um, and try to tackle some of those questions offline or whatever mechanism uh, Rubicon has for, for responding. Uh, thank you all for, for listening and thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, and I echo Nora too. Thank you for this opportunity and for the participation. And um, Ryan, you have my contact information. If uh, folks have questions for me, um, you know, feel free to provide them my information. Sounds perfect. Well, again, uh, this has been an excellent conversation and one that could go on for hours and hours. And uh, luckily, you know, we have the time uh, to make these changes and, and make this stuff happen. So uh, really excited to, to continue the conversation. Um, but for now, uh, I hope everybody has an incredible rest of your day.
Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everybody.